Book 10. The Grace of the Witch. We made our landfall on Iolia Island, domain of Iolos Hippotades, the Wind King, dear to the gods who never die, and Isla drift upon the sea, ringed round with brazen ramparts on a sheer cliffside. Twelve children had old Iolos at home, six daughters and six lusty sons, and he gave girls to boys to be their gentle brides, now those lords, in their parents' company, sup every day in hall a royal feast with fumes of sacrifice and winds that pipe round hollow courts, and all the night they sleep on beds of filigree beside their ladies. Here we put in, lodged in the town and palace, while Iolos played host to me. He kept me one full month to hear the tale of Troy, the ships and the return of the Achaeans, all which I told him point by point in order. When in return I asked his leave to sail and asked provisioning, he stinted nothing, adding a bull's hide sewn from neck to tail into a mighty bag, bottling storm winds, for Zeus had long ago made Iolo's warden of winds, to rouse or calm at will. He wedged this bag under my afterdeck, lashing the neck with shining silver wire so not a breath go through, only the west wind he lofted for me in a quartering breeze to take my squadron spanking home. No luck, the fair wind failed us when our prudence failed. Nine days and nights we sailed without event, till on the tenth we raised our land. We neared it and saw men building fires along the shore, but now, being weary to the bone, I fell into deep slumber, I had worked the sheet nine days alone and given it to no one, wishing to spill no wind on the homeward run. But while I slept, the crew began to parley, silver and gold, they guessed, were in that bag bestowed on me by Iolo's great heart, and one would glance at his benchmate and say, it never fails. He's welcome everywhere, hail to the captain when he goes ashore. He brought along so many presents, plunder out of Troy, that's it. How about ourselves, his shipmates all the way? Nigh home we are with empty hands. And who has gifts from Iolos? He has. I say we ought to crack that bag, there's gold and silver, plenty, in that bag. Temptation had its way with my companions, and they untied the bag. Then every wind roared into hurricane, the ships went pitching west with many cries, our land was lost. Roused up, despairing in that gloom, I thought, should I go overside for a quick finish or clench my teeth and stay among the living? Down in the bilge I lay, pulling my sea cloak over my head, while the rough gale blew the ships and rueful crews clear back to Iolia. We put ashore for water, then all hands gathered alongside for a mid-day meal. When we had taken bread and drink, I picked one soldier, and one herald, to go with me and called again on Iolos. I found him at meat with his young princes and his lady, but there beside the pillars, in his portico, we sat down silent at the open door. The sight amazed them, and they all exclaimed, Why back again, Odysseus? What sea fiend rose in your path? Did we not launch you well for home, or for whatever land you chose? Out of my melancholy, I replied, mischief aboard and nodding at the tiller, a damned drowse, did for me. Make good my loss, dear friends. You have the power. Gently I pleaded, but they turned cold and still. Said Father Iolos, take yourself out of this island, creeping thing, no law, no wisdom, lays it on me now to help a man the blessed gods detest, out. Your voyage here was cursed by heaven. He drove me from the place, grown as I would, and comfortless we went again to sea, days of it, till the men flagged at the oars, no breeze, no help in sight. By our own folly, six indistinguishable nights and days before we raised the Lestragonian height and far stronghold of Lamos. In that land the daybreak follows dusk, and so the shepherd homing calls to the cowherd setting out, and he who never slept could earn two wages, tending oxen, pasturing silvery flocks, where the low night path of the sun is near the sun's path by day. Here then, we found a curious bay with mountain walls of stone to left and right, and reaching far inland, a narrow entrance opening from the sea where cliffs converged as though to touch and close. All of my squadron sheltered here, inside the cavern of this bay. Black prow by prow those hulls were made fast in a limpid calm without a ripple, stillness all around them. My own black ship I chose to moor alone on the seaside, using a rock for bollard, and climbed a rocky point to get my bearings. No farms, no cultivated land appeared, but puffs of smoke rose in the wilderness, so I sent out two picked men and a herald to learn what race of men this land sustained. My party found a track, 
a wagon road for bringing wood down from the heights to town, and near the settlement they met a daughter of Antifates the Lestragon, a stalwart. Young girl taking her pail to Artachia, the fountain where these people go for water. My fellows hailed her, put their questions to her, who might the king be? Ruling over whom? She waved her hand, showing her father's lodge, so they approached it. In its gloom they saw a woman like a mountain crag, the queen, and loathed the sight of her. But she, for greeting, called from the meeting ground her lord and master, Antifates, who came to drink their blood. He seized one man and tore him on the spot, making a meal of him, the other two leaped out of doors and ran to join the ships. Behind, he raised the whole tribe howling, countless lastrigones, and more than men they seemed, gigantic when they gathered on the skyline to shoot great boulders down from slings, and hell's own crashing rose, and crying from the ships, as planks and men were smashed to bits, poor gobbets the wild men speared like fish and bore away. But long before it ended in the anchorage, havoc and slaughter, I had drawn my sword and cut my own ship's cable. Men, I shouted, man the oars and pull till your hearts break if you would put this butchery behind. The oarsmen rent the sea in mortal fear, and my ship spurted out of range, far out from the deep canyon where the rest were lost. So we fared onward, and death fell behind, and we took breath to grieve for our companions. Our next landfall was on Aiaiai, island of Kirk, dire beauty and divine, sister of baleful Aeetes, like him fathered by Helios the light of mortals on purse, child of the ocean stream. We came washed in our silent ship upon her shore, and found a cove, a haven for the ship, some god, invisible, con us in. We landed, to lie down in that place two days and nights, worn out and sick at heart, tasting our grief. But when dawn set another day a, shining I took my spear and broadsword, and I climbed a rocky point above the ship, for sight or sound of human labor. Gazing out from that high place over a land of thicket, oaks and wide watercourses, I could see a smoke wisp from the woodland hall of Kirk. So I took counsel with myself, should I go inland scouting out that reddish smoke? No, better not, I thought, but first return to waterside and ship, and give the men breakfast before I sent them to explore. Now as I went down quite alone, and came a bowshot from the ship, some god's compassion set a big buck in motion to cross my path, a stag with noble antlers, pacing down from pasture in the woods to the riverside, as long thirst, and the power of sun constrained him. He started from the bush and wheeled, I hit him square in the spine midway along his back and the bronze point broke through it. In the dust he fell and whinnied as life bled away. I set one foot against him, pulling hard to wrench my weapon from the wound, then left it, but, end on the ground. I plucked some withies and twined a double strand into a rope, enough to tie the hocks of my huge trophy, then pick a back, I lugged him to the ship, leaning on my long spear shaft, I could not haul that mighty carcass on one shoulder. Beside the ship I let him drop, and spoke gently and low to each man standing near, come, friends, though hard beset, will not go down into the house of death before our time. As long as food and drink remain aboard let us rely on it, not die of hunger. At this those faces, cloaked in desolation upon the waste sea beach, were bared, their eyes turned toward me, and the mighty trophy, lighting, foreseeing pleasure, one by one. So hands were washed to take what heaven sent us. And all that day until the sun went down we had our fill of venison and wine, till after sunset and the gathering dusk we slept at last above the line of breakers. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose made heaven bright, I called them round and said, Shipmates, companions in disastrous time, O my dear friends, where dawn lies, and the west, and where the great sun, light of men, may go under the earth by night, and where he rises, of these things we know nothing. Do we know any least thing to serve us now? I wonder. All that I saw when I went up the rock was one more island in the boundless main, a low landscape, covered with woods and scrub, and puffs of smoke ascending in mid-forest. They were all silent, but their hearts contracted, remembering Antifates the Lestragon, and that prodigious cannibal, the Kiklops. They cried out, and the salt tears with their eyes. But seeing our time for action lost in weeping, I mustered those Achaeans under arms, counting them off in two platoons, myself and my godlike Eurylocos commanding. We shook lots in a soldier's dog skin cap and his cane bounding out, valiant Eurylocos. So off he went, with twenty, two companions weeping, as mine wept, two, who stayed behind. 
In the wildwood they found an open glade, around a smooth stone house, the hall of Kirk, and wolves and mountain lions lay there, mild in her soft spell, fed on her drug of evil. None would attack, oh, it was strange, I tell you, but switching their long tails they faced our men like hounds, who look up when their master comes with tidbits for them, as he will, from table. Humbly those wolves and lions with mighty paws fawned on our men, who met their yellow eyes and feared them. In the entranceway they stayed to listen there, inside her quiet house they heard the goddess Kirk. Lo she sang in her beguiling voice, while on her loom she wove ambrosial fabric sheer and bright, by that craft known to the goddesses of heaven. No one would speak, until Polites, most faithful and likable of my officers, said, Dear friends, no need for stealth, here's a young weaver singing a pretty song to set the air a tingle on these lawns and paven courts. Goddess she is, or lady. Shall we greet her? So reassured, they all cried out together, and she came swiftly to the shining doors to call them in. All but your ilocos, who feared a snare, the innocents went after her. On thrones she seated them, and lounging chairs, while she prepared a meal of cheese and barley and amber honey mixed with pramnian wine, adding her own vile pinch, to make them lose desire or thought of our dear fatherland. Scarce had they drunk when she flew after them with her long stick and shut them in a pigsty, bodies, voices, heads, and bristles, all swinish now, though minds were still unchanged. So, squealing in they went. And Kirk tossed them acorns, mast, and cornell berries, fodder for hogs who rut and slumber on the earth. Down to the ship Eurilocos came running. To cry alarm, foul magic doomed his men. But working with dry lips to speak a word he could not, being so shaken, blinding tears welled in his eyes, foreboding filled his heart. When we were frantic questioning him, at last we heard the tale, our friends were gone. Said he, we went up through the oak scrub where you sent us, Odysseus, glory of commanders, until we found a palace in a glade, a marble house on open ground, and someone singing before her loom a chill, sweet song, goddess or girl, we could not tell. They hailed her, and then she stepped through shining doors and said, come, come in. Like sheep they followed her, but I saw cruel deceit, and stayed behind. Then all our fellows vanished. Not a sound, and nothing stirred, although I watched for hours. When I heard this I slung my silver, hilted broadsword on, and shouldered my long bow, and said, Come, take me back the way you came. But he put both his hands around my knees in desperate woe, and said in supplication, Not back there, O oh my lord. Oh, leave me here. You, even you, cannot return, I know it, I know you cannot bring away our shipmates, better make sail with these men, quickly too and save ourselves from horror while we may. But I replied, by heaven, Eurilocos, rest here then, take food and wine, stay in the black hull's shelter. Let me go, as I see nothing for it but to go. I turned and left him, left the shore and ship, and went up through the woodland hushed and shady to find the subtle witch in her long hall. But Hermes met me, with his golden wand, barring the way, a boy whose lip was downy in the first bloom of manhood, so he seemed. He took my hand and spoke as though he knew me. Why take the inland path alone, poor seafarer, by hill and dale upon this island all unknown? Your friends are locked in Kirk's pale, all are become like swine to sea, and if you go to set them free you go to stay, and never more make sail for your old home upon Thaki. But I can tell you what to do to come unchanged from Kirk's power and disenthrall your fighting crew, take with you to her bower as amulet, this plant I know, it will defeat her horrid show, so pure and potent is the flower, no mortal herb was ever so. Your cup with numbing drops of night and evil, stilled of all remorse, she will infuse to charm your sight, but this great herb with holy force will keep your mind and senses clear. When she turns cruel, coming near with her long stick to whip you out of doors, then let your cutting blade appear, let instant death upon it shine, and she will cower and yield. Her bed, a pleasure you must not decline, so may her lust and fear bestead you and your friends and break her spell, but make her swear by heaven and hell no witch's tricks, or else, your harness shed, you'll be unmanned by her as well. He bent down glittering for the magic plant and pulled it up, black root and milky flower, a molu in the language of the gods, fatigue and pain for mortals to uproot, but gods do this, and everything, with ease. Then toward Olympos through the island trees Hermes departed, and I sought out Kirk, my heart high with excitement, beating hard.
Before her mansion in the porch I stood to call her, all being still. Quick as a cat she opened her bright doors and sighed a welcome, then I strode after her with heavy heart down the long hall, and took the chair she gave me, silver, studded, intricately carved, made with a low footrest. The Lady Kirk mixed me a golden cup of honeyed wine, adding in mischief her unholy drug. I drank, and the drink failed. But she came forward aiming a stroke with her long stick, and whispered, down in the sty and snore among the rest. Without a word, I drew my sharpened sword, and in one bound held it against her throat. She cried out, then slid under to take my knees, catching her breath to say, in her distress, what champion, of what country, can you be? Where are your kinsmen and your city? Are you not sluggish with my wine? Ah, wonder. Never a mortal man that drank this cup, but when it passed his lips he had succumbed. Hail must your heart be, and your tempered will. Odysseus then you are, O great contender, of whom the glittering god with golden wands spoke to me ever, and foretold the black swift ship would carry you from Troy. Put up your weapon in the sheath. We two shall mingle and make love upon our bed. So mutual trust may come of play and love. To this I said, Kirk, am I a boy, that you should make me soft and doting now? Here in this house you turn my men to swine, now it is I myself you hold, enticing into your chamber, to your dangerous bed, to take my manhood when you have me stripped. I mount no bed of love with you upon it. Or swear me first a great oath, if I do, you'll work no more enchantment to my harm. She swore at once, outright, as I demanded, and after she had sworn, and bound herself, I entered Kirk's flawless bed of love. Presently in the hall her maids were busy, the nymphs who waited upon Kirk, for whose cradles were in fountains, under boughs, or in the glassy seaward, gliding streams. One came with richly colored rugs to throw on seat and chair back, over linen covers, a second pulled the tables out, all silver, and loaded them with baskets all of gold, a third. Mixed wine is tawny, mild as honey in a bright bowl, and set out golden cups. The fourth came bearing water, and lit a blaze under a cauldron. By and by it bubbled, and when the dazzling brazen vessel seated she filled a bathtub to my waist, and bathed me, pouring a soothing blend on head and shoulders, warming the soreness of my joints away. When she had done, and smoothed me with sweet oil, she put a tunic and a cloak around me, and took me to a silver, studded chair with footrest, all elaborately carven. Now came a maid to tip a golden jug of water into a silver finger bowl, and draw a polished table to my side. The larder mistress brought her tray of loaves with many savory slices, and she gave the best, to tempt me. But no pleasure came, I huddled with my mind elsewhere, oppressed. Kirk regarded me, as there I sat disconsolate, and never touched a crust. Then she stood over me and chided me, why sit a table mute, Odysseus? Are you mistrustful of my bread and drink? Can it be treachery that you fear again, after the gods? Great oath I swore for you. I turned to her at once and said, Kirk, where is the captain who could bear to touch this banquet in my place? A decent man would see his company before him first. Put heart in me to eat and drink, you may, by freeing my companions. I must see them. But Kirk had already turned away. Her long staff in her hand, she left the hall and opened up the sty. I saw her enter, driving those men turned swine to stand before me. She stroked them, each in turn, with some new chrism, and then, behold. Their bristles fell away, the coarse pelt grown upon them by her drug melted away, and they were men again, younger, more handsome, taller than before. Their eyes upon me, each one took my hands, and wild regret and longing pierced them through, so the room rang with sobs, and even Kirk pitted that transformation. Exquisite the goddess looked as she stood near me, saying, Son of Laertes, and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, go to the sea beach and sea, breasting. Ship, drag it ashore, full length upon the land, stow gear and stores in rock, holes under cover, return, be quick, bring all your dear companions. Now, being a man, I could not help consenting. So I went down to the sea beach and the ship, where I found all my other men on board, weeping, in despair along the benches. Sometimes in farmyards when the cows return well fed from pasture to the barn, one sees the pens give way before the calves in tumult, breaking through to cluster about their mothers, bumping together, bawling. 
Just that way my crew poured round me when they saw me come, their faces what with tears as if they saw their homeland, and the crags of Ithaca, even the very town where they were born. And weeping still they all cried out in greeting, Prince, what joy this is, your safe return. Now Ithaca seems here, and we in Ithaca. But tell us now, what death befell our friends? And, speaking gently, I replied, First we must get the ship high on the shingle, and stow our gear and stores in clefts of rock for cover. Then come follow me, to see your shipmates in the magic house of Kirk eating and drinking, endlessly regaled. They turned back, as commanded, to this work, only one lagged, and tried to hold the others, Eurylocos it was, who blurted out, were now poor remnants. Is it devil's work you long for? Will you go to Kirk's Hall? Swine, wolves, and lions she will make us all, beasts of her courtyard, bound by her enchantment. Remember those the Kiklops held, remember shipmates who made that visit with Odysseus. The daring man. They died for his foolishness. When I heard this I had a mind to draw the blade that swung against my side and chop him, bowling his head upon the ground, kinsman or no kinsman, close to me though he was. But others came between, saying, to stop me, prince, we can leave him, if you say the word, let him stay here on guard. As for ourselves, show us the way to Kirk's magic hall. So all turned inland, leading shore and ship, and Eurylocos, he too, came on behind, fearing the rough edge of my tongue. Meanwhile at Kirk's hands the rest were gently bathed, anointed with sweet oil, and dressed afresh in tunics, and new cloaks with fleecy linings. We found them all at supper when we came. But greeting their old friends once more, the crew could not hold back their tears, and now again the rooms rang with sobs. Then Kirk, loveliest of all immortals, came to counsel me, son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, enough of weeping fits. I know, I too, what you endured upon the inhuman sea, what odds you met on land from hostile men. Remain with me, and share my meat and wine, restore behind your ribs those gallant hearts that served you in the old days, when you sailed from stony Ithaca. Now parched and spent, your cruel wandering is all you think of, never of joy, after so many blows. As we were men we could not help consenting. So day by day we lingered, feasting long on roasts and wine, until a year grew fat. But when the passing months and wheeling seasons brought the long summery days, the pause of summer, my shipmates one day summoned me and said, Captain, shake. Off this trance, and think of home, if home indeed awaits us, if we shall ever see your own well, timbered hall on Ithaca. They made me feel a pang, and I agreed. That day, and all day long, from dawn to sundown, we feasted on roast meat and ruddy wine, and after sunset when the dusk came on my men slept in the shadowy hall, but I went through the dark to Kirk's flawless bed and took the goddess knees in supplication, urging, as she bent to hear, O oh Kirk, now you must keep your promise, it is time. Help me make sail for home. Day after day my longing quickens, and my company give me no peace, but were my heart away pleading when you are not at hand to hear. The loveliest of goddesses replied, Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, you shall not stay here longer against your will, but home you may not go unless you take a strange way round and come to the cold homes of death and pale Persephone. You shall hear prophecy from the rapt shade of blind Tiresias of Thebes, forever charged with reason even among the dead, to him alone, of all the flitting ghosts, Persephone has given a mind undarkened. At this I felt a weight like stone within me, and, moaning, pressed my length against the bed, with no desire to see the daylight more. But when I had wept and tossed and had my fill of this despair, at last I answered her, Kirk, who pilots me upon this journey. No man has ever sailed to the land of death. That loveliest of goddesses replied, son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master of land ways and sea ways, feel no dismay because you lack a pilot, only set up your mast and haul your canvas to the fresh blowing north, sit down and steer, and hold that wind, even to the bourne of ocean, Persephone's deserted strand and grove, dusky with poplars and the drooping willow. Run through the tide, rip, bring your ship to shore, land there, and find the crumbling homes of death. Here, toward the sorrowing water, run the streams of wailing, out of sticks, and quenchless burning, torrents that join in thunder at the rock. Here then, great soldier, setting foot obey me, dig a well shaft a forearm square, 
pour out libations round it to the unnumbered dead, sweet milk and honey, then sweet wine. And last clear water, scattering handfuls of white barley. Pray now, with all your heart, to the faint dead, swear you will sacrifice your finest heifer, at home in Ithaca, and burn for them her tenderest parts in sacrifice, and vow to the Lord Tiresias, apart from all, a black lamb, handsomest of all your flock, thus to appease the nations of the dead. Then slash a black ewe's throat, and a black ram, facing the gloom of Erebos, but turn your head away toward ocean. You shall see, now souls of the buried dead in shadowy hosts, and now you must call out to your companions to flay those sheep the bronze knife has cut down, for offerings, burnt flesh to those below, to sovereign death and pale Persephone. Meanwhile draw a sword from hip, crouch down, ward off the surging phantoms from the bloody pit, until you know the presence of Tiresias. He will come soon, great captain, be it he who gives you course and distance for your sailing homeward across the cold fish, breeding sea. As the goddess ended, dawn came stitched in gold. Now Kirk dressed me in my shirt and cloak, put on a gown of subtle tissue, silvery, then wound a golden belt about her waist and veiled her head in linen, while I went through the hall to rouse my crew. I bent above each one and gently said, Wake from your sleep, no more sweet slumber. Come, we sail the Lady Kirk so ordains it. They were soon up and ready at that word, but I was not to take my men unharmed from this place, even from this. Among them all the youngest was Elpinor, no mainstay in a fight nor very clever, and this one, having climbed on Kirk's roof to taste the cool night, fell asleep with wine. Waked by our morning voices and the tramp of men below, he started up, but missed his footing on the long steep backward ladder and fell that height headlong. The blow smashed the nape cord, and his ghost fled to the dark. But I was outside, walking with the rest, saying, Homeward you think we must be sailing to our own land, no, elsewhere is the voyage Kirk has laid upon me. We must go to the cold homes of death and pale Persephone to hear Tiresias tell of time to come. They felt so stricken, upon hearing this, they sat down wailing loud and tore their hair. But nothing came of giving way to grief. Down to the shore and ship at last we went, bowed with anguish, cheeks all wet with tears, to find that Kirk had been there before us and tied nearby a black ewe and a ram, she had gone by like air. For who could see the passage of a goddess unless she wished his mortal eyes aware?